Good morning, everyone. Thank you for popping in to the Daily Drop-In Morning Show. We are live currently streaming on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and LinkedIn. If you are listening to this after the fact on Teach Better Talk podcast, we appreciate you being here too. Good morning. It is Tuesday, March 15th, and we have a whole lot in store for you. We have a new family friend joining the Teach Better family this morning. We're so excited for you to meet Todd. We have good news stories for you. Obviously, our theme this week, we're going to be able to dive into about sharing your voice and a whole lot in store. So please go fill up your coffee, regardless of where you're listening from. We love those good morning messages. Please uh, listen after the fact, but we want to wish you a wonderful Tuesday. Let's get into it. Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday, March 15th. Todd, thank you for being live with us so bright and early. How you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I love that the first thing you said when you logged on this morning before we came live together, you were like, ignore my background. I'm in a hotel. I want to hear that story first, and then we need to get into who you are. But I'm dying to, to learn more about why you are streaming from a hotel this morning. Sure, sure. So um, I'm at our uh, state's Model United Nations event. Uh, I have 24 uh, middle schoolers uh, nestled with uh, visions of sugar plums in their beds right now. And uh, hopefully they'll stay awake uh, and during the duration of this. You're not supposed to. Be, luckily, they get to sleep in this morning. So I'm not waking them up till nine. So, yeah, so I'm here. And so it, it, I love bringing students to events like this because it's experiential learning. It's uh, authentic learning. Uh, kids are having to get up and debate world issues. Uh, they're having to uh, have a voice. They're having to make a, a stand on things. They're having to problem solve. So I, I always I've been doing Model United Nations for the past 15 years or so with uh, I bring high schoolers. I bring junior high kids. I bring kids from all over the all over the, um, you know, the spectrum and and I love doing that because, again, it gives them the opportunity to do something that, um, you know, a lot of these kids, I mean, these are fifth, sixth and seventh graders. A lot of these kids have never left their home before, like from their parents. Uh, and so, like, this is a huge experience for them. Like For me, it's like I'm at a hotel, you know, in downtown. I'm 15 minutes away from my house. But they're like, you know, I'm in a I'm in a hotel and, you know, and my parents aren't telling me what to do. Um, I'll share this funny story. I mean. The motto UN is really the, the, the things we're talking about are very important, but it was very funny. We went to dinner yesterday in the food court at the hotel. And so you have 24 kids that have 20 bucks each and they have this um, array of places to choose from to eat. And of course, most of them chose the boring subway, which is what uh, even though there's all these great places around there. But then there was an ice cream place and like kids are coming back with like little girls are coming with huge Sundays. One kid had two things. Other kids kid like three things a pop i'm like oh my goodness like uh, uh, i hope i hope you don't end up getting sick and so like but just the kids having choice like when they normally their parents would say no you can't buy that or no whatever and here they're like i can buy whatever i want and they they did so it was kind of funny i i just love those are i think some of my favorite memories as a teacher is going on the overnight trips with students field trips are always fun i encourage you know as often as we can to explore the world outside of our classrooms. Obviously there's limitations to a certain extent, but holy moly, the trips where you were able to take a student outside of their environment for more than 24 hours, grab a hotel, like we were talking earlier, making um, a trip in a big old bus, or I've even taken students on airplanes before, Holy moly, there's just so many giggles and laughter that comes from those trips. So I just so you know, I'm a little envious of you. Like I really wish that I was there experiencing the fun that you have with, uh, with those kids over the last few days. And I do want to revisit that here in just a bit, but I would love to start off our show to having you introduce yourself. I know a lot of our, our membership uh, here in the Teach Better community might know you, but if they don't, uh, what's your background in education? What do you do? So uh, my name is Todd Stanley, and I, I've been teaching. This is my 25th year in education. And uh, most of that has been spent in the realm of gifted, um, but it's also been working with all 
grade levels, which is kind of nice. So when I first started, I was a social studies teacher. My license was seventh through 12th grade. And my intention was to be a high school uh, social studies teacher. And then life happened. And the only job available was a middle school or junior high social studies teacher. And so I was like seventh and eighth graders. I'll do this for a couple of years and then I'll do high school. And then I started seventh and eighth graders and fell in love with working with those kids. Um, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, the interact. I mean, I, I know some people, I think some people are like destined to be with junior high students and some are, are just don't want to be with junior high students. It's kind of like that. You either love them or, or don't. And uh, I loved working with junior high students because they were old enough that you could have an adult conversation with them, but they, they weren't old enough that they're like, oh, I couldn't get my homework in because I was working or I got in a fight with my boyfriend or girlfriend last night or this or that. And so it was kind of like that sweet spot um, where they can still like they're thinking they're thinking a lot, but they're not dealing with all the crap that happens in the world. Totally, totally fair. I love my middle school age students. I know that it's always so fun to visit classrooms around the world that have all different age groups, of course, but middle school is the way to be. I know Holly Stewart's in the comments this morning. She's in a middle school realm as well. So she understands the the goofy, sarcastic, smelly student we're talking about right there. Uh -oh. <laughs> Absolutely. So I did that for a few years and then I, I had a, a unique opportunity to work at a program that was called the Christopher program. And it was a high school program and we pulled kids from all around the county. We had 16 um, districts in the county and we pulled them in. And it was um, experiential learning in downtown Columbus. And so these kids were coming from all, this, all the suburbs and they were coming to one place. Um, it was an interesting mix. You had very affluent schools. You had very, uh, you know, not so affluent schools. You had uh, different uh races you had different ethnicities you had all this stuff coming together in one place and it was all about it was a humanities uh, program so it was all about experiential learning so if you're going to learn about this you're going to go out and see it if you're going to learn about this you're going to go out and see it rather than just hear about it in a classroom um, we felt like our classroom was the city of columbus and so as much as possible we tried to get kids out so that was a wonderful experience because i get introduced to uh, project-based learning and I got uh, introduced to experiential learning, which were two things that have kind of um, uh, since have now really uh, pushed forward with what I do with kids and what I, how I work with kids. Um, I went straight from teaching juniors and seniors in high school to going back to my, my original district because uh, I was a teacher on loan and working with third graders. And I remember how big a that transition that was. And, and the reason why I was able to do that, even though my license was seven through 12 social studies, is I also have my gifted license K through 12. So I could work with kids from any grade level as long as I wasn't like the teacher of record. And so I went and taught a gifted pullout program. Kids came to me and we did project based learning together. And I remember the first day back and I was teaching a lesson or whatever. And this one girl raised her hand and she goes, you do realize we're third graders, right? And I'm like, oh yeah, I got to make the pivot uh, from the high school to the to the elementary. And then I've taught uh, fifth grade, fifth grade through eighth grade for several years. And now I'm the gifted co for the last seven years. I've been the gifted services coordinator for a, a suburban district with about 10,000 students uh, in Pickerington, Ohio. Uh, and so I've really enjoyed that. Um, it's an administrative job. Um, and so one of the um, a lot of the administrators that I work with don't get the opportunities to work with kids because I'm in the district office. And so they're sitting at their desk, they're doing curriculum, they're doing whatever, and they're doing a very good job at that. But one of the things for me um, when I got the job is like I need to still be working with kids because mo as most people know, working with kids is so much better than working with adults because kids will actually listen and they'll try things and they'll, you know, they're willing to engage in thought. And sometimes working with adults can be very, very frustrating. And so it's kind of my release. Like I'll work with adults on something, get really frustrated and then go teach a uh, invention convention class or whatever. And then same thing, like I'm working with adults and I get to come to Model United Nations for two days with kids. So, you know, it's really nice. I, I almost feel like the uh, the grandparents, because what happens is Kids work with me. I get them all riled up and everything. And I send them home to their parents. They're the regular teachers and they have to work with them. And um, and so I really enjoy that aspect. I get kids and, you know, I get the opportunity to get the kids thinking. And um, and again, I work with all grade levels. I work with um, we have four, 14 schools in our district, seven elementary, three middle, two junior high, two high school. I work with every building on something or other with some sort of enrichment, um, extracurricular enrichment. For students and so got a whole variety of different things i do and different kids i work with so it's a lot of fun 
Todd, you seem like somebody who has such a cool job. You need an assistant. Can I can I be your assistant? Does that sound okay? I, I wish they would let me have an assistant, to be quite honest, because sometimes I feel like I'm doing three jobs. Uh, yeah, I think I think I would be a good option for you. I'd like to throw my my hat in the ring and say, okay, Ray Heward is your assistant. I mean, I'm organized, I'm passionate, I'm I'm well educated in at least some of the topics you just brought up. I think I'm a good option for you. I'm just saying. I think you need to consider. Duly noted. Duly noted. I will. I will make note of that and uh, and let my board know. So. So good. You know, Todd, we have a lot of stuff that we're going to get into um, this morning all together. But I always love to ask. Sometimes we bring in faces to daily drop in. They've been in the Teach Better community for ages. Sometimes they're relatively new. Can you tell us a little bit? How did you get connected to the Teach Better team? Sure. So, you know, I'm active on Twitter. I try to stay, um, you know, that it's a professional learning network, I think is really effective because you can reach a lot of voices. And so what was really interesting is I would, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not on Twitter all the time, but when I'm on Twitter, you know, I would always run across, it was like, you might like teach better team. And I'd be like, okay, that's kind of interesting. And, and it was, it was like constantly showing up in my, my stream. And so I was like, I need to check these people out. So like, I went onto the website and I'm like, wow, you know, this is such an amazing community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I decided, you know, I, I got to be part of this. So I reached out and started writing a blog. I've written a couple of blogs already uh, for them. Um, I'm also a writer uh, by heart uh, or not by heart, by, by, by I, I, I've written um, quite a few books and I write blogs pretty regularly. And so I originally went to school to be a creative writer. Uh, and then I, when I realized that you can't actually get a job as a creative writer, then I went back and got my teaching license. And mm -hmm. so I've been able to, the nice thing about it is they, they always tell you when you're in those writing classes, write what you know. Like, and so I, I feel like I'm at the point where I know teaching pretty well. And so that's what I've been writing about the last 15 years or so. And so I've gone from writing fiction to writing uh, uh, teacher workbooks or teacher, uh, you know, uh, talking about pedagogy and things of that nature. And so that's what, that's what I've been doing lately. And so that's how I kind of hooked up with Teach Better is that I was like, I want to write blogs for them and I want to work with them. And uh, it was just such an interesting, um, interesting community to be a part of. Sure. No, we're so thrilled that you are. I love that you can give our blog department a massive shout out. If you guys have not done so recently, whether you have in the past or have never before, today is the day. Go ahead to teachbetter.com slash blogs. There are so many new blogs there every single day, especially those. There's multiple that are typically aligned to the daily drop in morning show. So if you're tuning in this morning, if you tune in frequently, um, there's a lot more content building on some of our ideas, building on the incredible people that have been able to join the show before continuously sharing their voices over in the blog, in addition to lots of other topics as well. So Todd, I appreciate you being an incredible guest blogger. We have over 200 guest bloggers that contribute to our blog and we put out, I mean, at least one blog, if not multiple a day. So there's a lot of content over there. There's a lot to consume, a lot of great ideas. So I really appreciate you. No problem. As we get into our show this morning, we really do love to use an app and I'm not sure Todd, if you're familiar, but I think you'll catch on pretty quick. It's an app called Happy Feed, and every single morning we love to document a moment of gratitude. This is something that was exposed to us early on just a few weeks ago, and we learned that this is not only an intentional moment to, to be appreciative of something in our lives, but also an intentional moment to document something that we can revisit later. There's a lot of ways to document gratitude, but specifically using this free app called Happy Feed, we love being able to document live here on our show and then also revisit past memories and, and little fun things like that. So we're really excited to be kind of curating our bank here this morning. Obviously, we can document anything that we are appreciative of this morning. So, Todd, I'm going to ask you here in just a second something that you are grateful for in some way. But there is always a hint, and I always do enjoy reading them, even if I don't use them as inspiration. The one this morning says, give yourself a nice stretch. Get the blood flowing go find um, some comfort in your body and getting it moving. So trying to find something that we're appreciative of, appreciative of, grateful for, whether it be related to physical health or not. Todd, what comes to mind as something that you might be appreciative of or grateful for this morning? If it's all right, I'm going to do two things, if that's okay. So the first off is the obvious, my family. Like the month of March for me um, as the gifted coordinator is insane. Like I'm here with kids from Modern United Nations. Last weekend, I was doing Destination Imagination with students. I've been getting home at 8 o'clock most nights this month. Um, and yet my family is very supportive. My wife's like, oh, you know, I know this month's pretty crazy. Do what you have to do and I'll see you in a month. 
And so uh, I just want to put a shout out to my family. Very appreciative of them and very, uh, you know, had a lot of gratitude for them. My older daughter's picking me up from this event today, so I didn't have to pay for parking. So it's kind of like a fan. And she was one of my judges at Destination Imagination last uh, last week. So it's it's a family event. So um, I'm really appreciative of them and what they, they allow me to do. I'm also, and this is going to sound like a major kiss up, but I am also very appreciative to my district because of the latitude they give me in my position. I know a lot of colleagues of mine who are in similar positions are just uh, inundated with with like, here's more work, here's diff work that's not really tied to, to gift it, get the department, but we want you to do it and whatever. And the district I'm with just really gives me a lot of freedom to be able to do things like this. Um, to where I'm not shackled to a desk and I get to get out and work with kids. And uh, it's, it's a good, I know it's a good day for me when I've been to five or six schools in my district, uh, rather than being in my office all day, staring at a screen when, when COVID hit and, and we were having all these meetings and I was staring at a screen all day long. It got to the point where at the end of the day, like I couldn't focus my eyes. Like I literally would have to get up and walk around the school for 10 minutes to refocus before I could get in my car and drive home because mm -hmm. just staring at a screen all day and being so sedentary uh, just did not work with the kind of uh, learn, teaching and learning I like to do, which is getting out and being hands on and working with kids. Yeah. No, I think that's wonderful. And I love being able to share our gratitude for not only things that we think of frequently. I think many people are so, so appreciative um, for family. It's wonderful to take a moment to not only share that with each other, but share that with our loved ones, but also the moment to also acknowledge that our districts are doing good work. There is um, incredible things going on in our schools. And sometimes we forget and to, to really appreciate uh, the things going on. So I appreciate that reminder this morning, Todd. We're going to transition here into our first segment of the show. It is Tuesday, so we are headed into brainstorming. <laughs> Todd, I just want you to know that that was the wrong commercial, and I'm going to click the right one right now, and you guys are going to be so impressed. So just hold on. All right, friends, you all know my theory. I think you're supposed to mess up once a day, and I just did it for all of us. So if you're tuning in live with us, or even if you're listening after the fact, I got our mistake for the day out of the way. Congratulations. All of us are going to have a really good Tuesday ahead of us. Yeah. Good to get out of the way early that way. <laughs> That's the thing, right? I mean, I don't know about you, Todd. I think you're uh, East, Eastern time zone. I'm Central time zone. We already got our mistake out of the way at 6 a.m., 7 a.m. This is a win for the day. Think about how much opportunity we now have before us, and we know it's going to go well. Sky's the limit, so... I love it. For this segment, as many of you know, if you tune into the show frequently, we do our brainstorm bank every single day. It's an opportunity for us to truly just pause and ask our community, hey, friends, do you need anything? I do have a feeling that some of you needed the mistake today to not be your fault. And this is why I clicked the wrong commercial. So I apologize to all of you. But we are going to be here this morning answering your questions and doing anything we can to support you in our in our pursuit to be better. Uh, Todd, I know there are a lot of things that you're passionate about that we want to get into in this segment. One of the things that we um, specifically are focusing on this week is the opportunity for educators to share their voice, kind of this theme of applying and speaking at conference events and also knowing what we consider ourselves an expert in and what we want to share our ideas and our passions with with others. So Todd, with, with how much you've done, book writing, blog writing, obviously you've moved in your position numerous times to support so many different educators and students. Are, are you somebody who would ever consider speaking at a conference? Uh, I speak at quite a few of them, actually. So uh, yeah, so and I can give you the evolution of that, how that happened is that, first off, I think all teachers have a voice to share. They have something that's worthwhile to share. They have something that others want to listen to. Um, and so for me, how that started out is I was I started doing project based learning in my classroom um, with my students and it just started it started very organically where I started I was a traditional teacher, pull out the textbook, read the chapter, blah, 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 this. And then every once in a while I would sprinkle in a project here or there. And then a few years later, when a kid would come back from the high school to visit me at the junior high, they would be like, you know, Mr. they never came back and said, Mr. Stanley, I remember this worksheet we did. I remember that chapter that we read, or I remember that time you lectured at us. It was always, hey, I remember that project we did. And so every single, almost every single kid to a T who would come back, would, that's what they remember. And I'm like, wait, if this is what they're remembering, 
I should just be doing this all the time. It, this is memorable. And so, you know, the whole point is not that we, that we expose them to it is that they learn it and that it's enduring. And so, um, so I started doing, instead of doing projects, I started doing project-based learning where the learn, the learning was taking place by doing the projects. And so started doing that in the classroom, started to gain some confidence in that started to get the, you know, feel pretty, uh, pretty good about that. And I'm like, I want to share this with others. I think everyone should be doing this because I don't see this that much. Mm -hmm. And so we have local conferences. We have what the OAGC, which is the Ohio Association for Gifted Children Conference. Mm -hmm. And they always were asking for speakers. And uh, about, and I think it was probably about 12, 15 years ago, I was like, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot. So I, I applied and got accepted and then did my first conference. And then it went really well. And so I was like, Oh, this is kind of, this is kind of cool. And so, um, I started, do, I kept doing the free conferences and free conferences and applying for them because the, the one thing about conferences that it's always interesting is that you, at least the conferences that I attend a lot of times is you get to, they, they allow you to present. You just have to come and pay to come to the, so you're paying them to present kind of. And so, which is fine. That's just the way that this, the way it works. And um, it's, you always get a really good conference out of it. So that's, it's no big deal. Make sure you pick a conference that you want to go to. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did that for years and years and years. And then, and then people started reaching out to me and saying, Hey, would you be willing to speak at this conference? Or would you be willing to do this? And I'd be like, sure. And so um, my travels have taken me all the way to Australia. I got a, an opportunity to speak at the um, teaching and learning conference in, uh, that was sponsored um, in Australia by my publisher. And I went out there for four days to Melbourne, Australia, and got to speak to people at a conference. And uh, it was it was great. Um, and what was really enlightening for me is, you know, I was working with uh, obviously primarily Australian teachers and I'm like, well, I hope this thing translates because um, they literally translate my books. Not not like it's it's still English, but like they put the U's in there and they 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 link the standards to Australia. And I didn't realize that was going on until they asked me to come speak. And they showed me an Australian version of one of my books. And so when I went to talk to them, pr the issues that are going on are universal. Like it's the same thing. It's It's like same same stuff different day like it's they're dealing with the exact same things that we're dealing with here um, and then i found this out further when i went to a conference in nashville the world um gifted con gifted uh children concert a con conference it felt like a concert conference and uh, i was talking to people i was in a panel with people from all over the world i mean one was from saudi arabia one was from australia one was from um kentucky that's kind of the other world to me and uh and we were talking about things that were very common to us. So people all across the, you know, the world, again, are having these similar problems. So that was a wonderful experience. And so, uh, so as it keeps going, you know, I, I keep getting, I keep, I keep doing the, the free gigs to, to work on things. And I keep, like, I just got invited to the uh, Washington state um, gifted conference. That's going to take place in October. So I go and get, they're going to fly me out there and I get a chance to be a keynote speaker. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and it's, I love sharing my voice, but I also love, working with teachers and sharing ideas and say like, here's, here's something that I've done. Um, let me give you the confidence to try it. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. If you leave one of my conferences or one of my sessions and you don't have something that you can take back to your classroom, I have failed. Um, so I'm not, I'm not a real theory guy. I'm a practice guy. I'm like, this is, this is something that you need to work. This is how you do it. So because people will say, well, you know, you need to differentiate with kids. And it's like, what does that look like? like? How do you do? I think that's a word that we throw around a lot in education that not a lot of teachers know how to do it and what it looks like. And so I'm like, look, if you're going to differentiate with teachers, here are some steps you might go through. Or here are some op options you might try. And so I always try to give practical um, and, and um, battle, battle tested, classroom tested things that I'm doing. So I'm not talking about things that I haven't done. Um, so, for example, there's a. Um, thinking platform called depth and complexity. And I was right. And, and so I, I reached out to them and we talked about writing a book together. Um, and I was like, well, I haven't used this in the classroom. I've been out of the classroom for seven years. I still work with kids, but I haven't been in the classroom for seven years. And so I volunteered this year to teach a class of third graders so that I could try the depth and complexity with them. And so I could say, Hey, you know, I actually use this and this is how you sit in the classroom because again, I never want anything to be theory. I want it to be practice because we're not in the theory uh, game. We're not in the theory, uh, you know, uh, job. We're in the practice. I mean, you have to get in there and it has to work with kids. 
And you have to know that you have the confidence uh, to be able to do that. I love it. No, Todd, I knew this was going to be a good conversation for us because our theme this week, we have a course coming out, a free course coming out in our Teach Better Academy. And the goal is just to support educators in applying to conferences. And it really isn't anything more that that we're trying to, to sell you. It's just this concept of educators sharing their voice. And when you want to share your voice, when you're ready to say, hey, I want to get involved in a conference, what types of things should you consider? Not only what type of title should you create or the description that you should be prepared for, but what other things like the fact that subconferences as a presenter, you might be paying the registration fee, kind of all those details. How do you get into this space? And yes, of course, Teach Better conference proposals are open for those of you who may be using this course to submit for us to, you know, to speak at our event, but but also it's applicable to any event that you might be submitting an idea to share your voice at an event. I really appreciate it. You know, Todd, here in a second, I'm going to ask you if you have a, a favorite tip or trick when applying to a conference, maybe something that's worked really well for you when you've been searching for a conference to present at or something that you found successful when you've been applying to be a speaker. And before we do that, we are going to play a little clip that was featuring two new featured speakers in the Teach Better Conference lineup and uh, just celebrating people that have already committed to being part of the event. And hopefully then anybody, anybody listening also submits a proposal to join this lineup as well. We'll be right back. As a world-renowned educator who speaks and does keynotes at conferences all the time, tell us a little bit, what is a trick or suggestion that you can give our community when maybe getting into this space a little bit more intentionally? Sure, sure. Well, first off, I appreciate the word rural renowned, but not really. I just want to make sure. That... So, um, by the way, uh, I know I know people use coffee in the morning, but boy, your music is great. Like, it's really getting me up, like, it's waking me up this morning. So, I appreciate it. Goal, right? That's the goal. Trying to wake everybody up this morning. Yep. So uh, my 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 I have lots of advice. Like I just I just actually wrote a blog for Teach Better about the five mistakes and it kind of ties into what, what happened today. The five mistakes that I may have made that you can avoid. Um uh and so that that that's gonna be here, I think in the next week or so that's gonna be on there. But uh because one thing you do learn is that uh, you don't know what you don't know. And so when you get to conferences, sometimes you're not aware of things and or you don't you think like, oh, they'll have like a projector and <laughs> they may not. I mean, nowadays they usually do. But I remember I went to one and like I just assumed they were going to have a projector and they did not. We we're supposed to bring our own. So I had to beg and borrow from someone to get theirs before I went on. And so uh, but the thing I would the biggest piece of advice I would get is make sure that you would present at a conference that you would actually go to. So don't like just go to any don't pick any conference and don't, you know, just say, oh, I'm, I just want to get the chance to speak at a conference. I always try. I always pick conferences that I would attend myself because because it's a group. It's a community that I would like to learn more from. Um, it, it's a two way street. Like when you some people I, I've been to I, we've had speakers come to different things and they come in, they give their thing and then they leave and they're on the plane and they're off to their next speaking gig. When I go to a conference like that, like I'm not there only to present. I'm there to learn from others as well. So whether I'm a, a keynote or I'm in this small room with like 20, 20, you know, chairs, I'm there to learn with everyone else. So my biggest advice is that you should definitely pick a conference that you would want to attend yourself. And that way, you know, when you're there, you're connecting with teachers and you're not it's not just about you. It's about the community because the community is really important. So this is why I speak a lot at the Ohio Association for Gifted Children because it's an organization um, that I really support and really uh, agree with. This is why I've applied to the Teach Better conference. That's going to be in Akron uh, because this is a community I think really is doing wonderful things. And there's some I want to hear what people have to say. Uh, so 
I, I guess to, to boil it down into a for, uh, fortune cookie uh, uh, saying is uh, don't go to a conference that you wouldn't or don't speak at a conference you wouldn't go to yourself. I love it. No, that's so, so, so good. And then I love the connection to a blog you're providing as well. Five mistakes at a at a conference. Gosh, I feel like we all need to review that. I, I just feel like there, there's constantly miscommunication elements that can come with applying to a conference. And if you're in any way better by avoiding some basic mistakes, <laughs> I think that's wonderful, Todd. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. As you are uh, waking up this morning, friends, we'd love to hear from you. Of course, you're welcome to throw your questions in the comments at any time or reach out to Todd on social media to continue this dialogue. But Todd, I do know that you are passionate about more than just speaking at conferences. Obviously, with, with the opportunities that you've had thus far, there's a lot to be able to dive into. But you know, in addition to being able to share your voice at conferences and inspire other educators around the world, we do want to make sure that you know, we also hit other passion spaces for you. So will you tell us a little bit about, I know this is like picking your favorite child. Tell us a little bit about maybe a book that you've written that you feel is most relevant to teachers right now. I know you have a few different options to go from. Sure. So I just uh, wrote a book with First Education um, and, and it's called How the Hell Do We Motivate These Kids? And uh, the, the purpose of the book is to, I work, I've worked a lot with gifted students. And so that is a huge passion of mine. Like, Gifted students um, a lot of times get overlooked, believe it or not, um, or maybe you do believe it. But a lot of times we're like we in, in schools, what we tend to do is we tend to triage. So we look at the biggest problems and we take care of those problems first. And then if we have time left over, we'll work with these students here. And so a lot of focus comes on the other end of the spectrum. So, you know, we have our RTI, we have our special, all that stuff. And those are students we definitely need to work with. But the focus is so much on that, that a lot of times it's like, well, the gifted kids are going to be OK. I mean, I've literally had teachers say that to me. Well, I'm like, what do you do with the gifted students? Well, I just let, leave them be. They're, they're going to be fine by themselves. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that they're not necessarily going to be fine by themselves. They need they have needs just like any other student. They have special needs just like other students. And they need to have those needs addressed. And so that's a huge passion of mine is working with gifted students and working with teachers to understand the myths of working with gifted students and how we do need to make sure that we are, um, you know, engaging these students that we are trying to get that, you know, to help them to reach their, I mean, we're, they're like, well, they have so much potential already. And it's like, correct, but we need to take them as far as we can with that potential. So I feel like that's like 90% of my job is um, educating uh, people who are not in the gifted world what do you do with gifted students? What are some things that practical things that you could do? You know, I always get teachers that will email me and be like, you know, uh, my kid finished early. My kids are finishing early. What do I do? And I'm like, what are you doing now? And they're like, well, we give them more work. And I'm like, uh, why, why you're punishing them for like getting their work done early. Why don't you give them different work rather than, you know, more work and work that's going to engage them. And I mean, I had another teacher that said to me once, you know, they were doing a pre-assessment with the kid and she's like, my kid got hundred percent of the pre-assessment. I'm like, Oh, what did you do with them? They're like, Oh, I made them go through the unit anyways. Like they just showed you that they know it. They've mastered it. They have it. And why, and you made them do it again. They're like, well, it's not going to hurt them to go through it again. But the problem, the thinking is it. And the, the problem with that thinking is that it is going to hurt them because you it's an opportunity cost. They've lost the opportunity to learn about something that they, they could have engaged them or really could have pushed their thinking or whatever because they were stuck doing this thing that they already know. Mm -hmm. And so really passionate about that. And, and the thing that people always ask me is like, well, what is the trick to working with gifted students? And the trick is just good teaching and good teaching practices. So I do project-based learning with my gifted students. I do project-based learning with my special ed students. I do project-based learning with many students. And so this, how, how the hell do we motivate these kids was my effort, because a lot of my books are aimed specifically gifted, was my effort to say, look, this works with all kids. If you, if you engage kids, you give them choice. If you let them be passionate about things, if you show that you care, then kids are going to be more motivated. And so I, and so again, as I said, like, trying to work, trying to um, do this in practice rather than theory. So I decided I worked, I, I ended up working with a gentleman at one of our high schools. He is, he has a class full of kids who are like on the verge of flunking out. Like they have failed all their classes. They've been put into this class because they're trying to recover. It's they're trying to recover their, you know, um, 
their schooling and trying to get them, just trying to get them across the finish line. And so these are the kids who are the least motivated kids in the district. Um, not because of, sometimes it's not by choice. Sometimes it's because of other factors, things of that nature. And him, he and I created a project together. Um, he's a science and math teacher. He's like, you know, I just want these kids to do anything. I want them to, be, to care about something. And so we created a really high interest project and, um, and we, we, we ran that out to them. And again, sometimes like you feel like you're, you're talking to a wall because these kids just have had teachers talking to them. They're, they're high school. So they were really jaded by this point. And they've had teachers that have tried to try things before. Um, but we were like, look, we're going to give you choice to do this. We're going to give you, and it was, it wasn't a slam dunk. Like everyone was, per, you know, Oh, we're, but the, you know, the angels were singing or, but we had kids that were more engaged than they normally would be. Like I had that one of the, the, the um, aides that worked and she's like, those kids were, you know, seem more interested than I've ever seen them all year. And so I got the chance to do, to work with those kids and with that teacher to, to try that. And so I really, the, how, the, how the hell do we motivate these kids is, is my, um, is kind of like my, um, manifesto. So if like, if, if that's a lot if, out of all the books, that's the one that people read. Uh, that's the one that I, I think really truly embodies my philosophy as a teacher and embodies uh, the work that I do with students and try to do with students and teachers. So. Mm, so powerful. And here at the end of the show, obviously we will remind all of you how to stay connected to Todd and obviously engage with all of his content that he continues to push out, including his incredible books. But Todd, let us know your books are they available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Can we just search your name and, and find all these resources at the tips of our fingers? Yes. If you go to uh, Amazon and put in Todd Stanley, the, the first full page will be all my books. I mean, like I've, I've written over 20 at this point. So, uh, and so, yeah, it's a, I remember the first time like it was finally in there. I was like, oh, I've got a book on Amazon. And now I go on there and it's the whole page. So like uh, not to be egotistical, it is like, oh, my goodness. You know, uh, you know, I have a lot of books out there. and People are always like you're a very prolific writer. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But, yeah, I do like to I do like to put out a couple books a year. Um, and so I write with different publishers, but m primarily with Proof Rock, which was then bought by Rutledge. And so. That is specific to gifted, um, but I but I also have written a book for Corwin, and like I said, uh, first educational. Uh, I wrote this uh, how to how them we motivate. So, uh, yeah, that's how. Well, you I appreciate that you are choosing to share so much insight with us, and I love the journey that educators go on to write books. And so, whether you are listening now live with us or even after the fact, please feel free to reach out to Todd. There's so much to learn about so many different topics that you shared thus far, Todd. I know that we're going to transition here into our good news article and our holidays for the day. But before we do, I'd love to kind of ask you about your soapbox topic. And maybe it's something that we've already discussed. Maybe we could dive deeper into it. But if if someone was tuning into the show right now and they were only going to be able to listen for a few moments, what is a major takeaway, maybe a challenge, a call to action that we want to give our Teach Better community, something that you're really passionate about? Sure. Uh, and I, I have already talked about it, which it, it is about like um, working with with all students and meeting all their needs. So uh, I do realize, I mean, teachers have a very difficult, I know people say this all the time, but the reality is they do have a very difficult job is that in some districts you throw, you throw all the kids into a classroom and they, you have kids who, I, I always feel for kindergarten teachers because you have a kid that comes in that knows their alphabet, their numbers, they can read chapter books and you have a kid that can't cite uh, identify a letter and you have to work with those kids in the same classroom and you have to try to move them along together and you try to have to try to. So differentiation um, is incredibly difficult. Um, and so I, I try to make that easier by clustering kids. So putting kids of like ability together so that you're not your spectrum is not as large as it is. But, um, I, I, you know, I would say my soapbox was that, you, you know, you have to realize that everyone in your classroom has specific needs and mm -hmm. We, we, when I went to school, um, I know it was a while ago, but like the teacher just taught and you tried to catch up and that was the way it worked. And um, we're in the we're in the game now, which, which is something I've seen through the evolution of my 25 years in education, which is a great evolution, which is that like we realize that personalized learning is the most important thing. And so we have to design things that are more personalized. That's why I did project based learning, because you can really be personalized with that. And the most important thing about it is it frees you up to have conversations with students. So instead of talking to 30 kids at once in a lecture and a lesson and whatever, you get kids started on the project and they're working on them independently. And I can go around and have 
individual conversations with kids and I can figure out this is what this kid needs. This is what this kid needs. This is what I need to be work, think, watching this kid for. This is another kid that, you know, it's doing really well. So I'm just going to check in with him every once in a while, but he seems like he's got it. So, um, so, you know, the, my, my biggest uh, soapbox would be like personalize the learning, no matter whether it's gifted, special ed, whatever. We need to figure out ways to do that and strategies to do that. And so it's always disheartening, disheartening to me when I walk into high schools, especially, and all the desks are pointed towards the front of the room and the teacher desk is up front and the, the I call this the tombstone configuration. It looks like a cemetery. And so you have, you have, and so, and then I walk into like middle school and elementary schools and it seems like chaos, but it's beautiful. I mean, it's, it's organized chaos. Kids are not lined up in rows. This is, I mean, I think the biggest, my biggest uh, heartbreaking moment for COVID is when I walk into a class and kids were in rows again, because they had to be because they had to have assigned seats. They had to be six feet apart. They had to whatever. And I'm like, we just took like a major step back. Like, I feel like we're finally getting to the point where we're getting kids engaged. We're, we're letting them, you know, be fluid in what, what they're, and then now we're assigning them seats again and putting them in rows. And, and we're not allow, allowing them to collaborate with one another because they can't. So when COVID first hit, that was definitely how things were. And it was very heartbreaking. We've since you know moved on from that. And we're allowing kids to collaborate now. When you walk into the, I, the teachers, I, I uh, supervise a program in our district called the Gateway Program. And it's a magnet program. And I walked into those classrooms and kids are just they're They've got unique, they've got standing desk and bean bags and this, and there's all this kind of flexible seating and kids are sitting wherever they want to. And the wall is open and two classes are working together. And it's just a thing of beauty. Uh, and then I walk and then unfortunately, and I don't mean to bash on high school teachers, but I walk into high school or junior high and high school and it's all about compliance. Let's put them in rows. Let's make sure that we're um, keeping them in line. And that, because I understand you're, you have 150 kids that you're, you're teaching. And I, I understand that, but I, it can be done. I've seen people do project-based learning in high school students. I did project-based learning with high school students. I've seen people do those things. And I think we need to, to understand as educators that we need to be personalizing the learning for all of our students and not just say, well, they're at the point now where they should be able to do this. Uh, we should never make that assumption. We should always um, try and be trying to get them to learn things and seeing what they do know and then working with them individually. Yeah, for those of you who are listening, we are huge here on the Teach Better team, huge advocates for personalized learning. There are absolutely so many models out there to help you reach all the learners in your classroom. Diverse learners are some of the most exciting students to be able to, to offer some, some differentiation for. And, and I think that some of the hurdles that we have as educators is not knowing how to do that on a consistent basis. Obviously, there's a lot of different frameworks out there, but for those of you who are familiar with the GRID method, that is truly hitting at the core of what our team believes in is that classrooms should be full of collaboration and personalized learning. So if any of you are interested in exploring the grid method more, there's a free course and a full course over in the Teach Better Academy. Or if you find other models that you really enjoy, share them with us. We'd love to make sure that as many educators as possible have access to really powerful tools. And project-based learning is how I used to run my middle school classroom utilizing the grid method. So if you're looking for some of those frameworks, it's a great spot to be able to layer some things together, right? Create that perfect deli sandwich that makes up a great classroom. So we'll be right back with some good news and some holidays. our show this morning we have some good news and some holidays that we're gonna be celebrating todd how do you feel about celebrating a good holiday uh i'm always up for that yes always always up for celebrating something something goofy something fun something that makes us smile yep yep i do national, pie day, national pie day yesterday oh what a you know oh. what a great opportunity so <laughs> i know we love celebrating the wacky holidays that we have every single day especially the ones that give us permission to eat weird foods i'm always a fan of that Oh, Today yeah. is full of actually some, some really interesting holidays, slightly more serious, less food related, but we do want to shout out a few of these very special ones. One is that it's World Speech Day. So as we discuss, you all hoping to present at conferences, maybe taking the, the free course that comes out in the academy this week, but more importantly, submitting your proposal to not only the Teach Better Conference, but any event that you can share your insight at. 
today's World Speech Day. So let's uh let's get after it. It's also World Social Work Day. So if you are um, supported by incredible social workers, please make sure that you share your appreciation, not only in your school buildings, but also obviously all over um, our communities that have that type of support. Really, really important. Uh, Todd, I can only assume that you're able to work with social workers in your, in your, in your role as well. Yes, absolutely. And they do, they do wonderful. They, they do the most difficult work. I, I think that they, you know, they take on quite a bit. So yeah, I appreciate our social workers. So. So good for a good news article this morning. We have a little bit of something funny for you. We do hope that you go look this up maybe during your lunch break or right before students enter your classroom today. This might be something that you can actually utilize in your journey as you head into the week. This headline says elementary students give you pep talks on a recorded um, phone hotline and they're kind of adorable. So it says, sometimes it's said that wisdom of, often comes from the mouths of babes, but what? But does it mention that all you have to do is dial one first? A new telephone hotline is relieving stress and uplifting callers with laughter, words of encouragement, and advice from elementary school students, and it's off the hook. This pop line is called Pep Talk Hotline. Uh, it was uh, the brainchild of a local art teacher uh, shout out to teacher Jessica Martin, who figured out that she could create smiles in her California community by allowing her elementary students to share their voices. They are receiving 300 to 400 calls an hour now with these encouraging messages. They have the phone number here, but shout out to Westside Elementary that is uh, working to not only provide these pep talks from elementary students, but also I'll provide them in multiple languages, including Spanish and English. They are um, little messages that are pre-recorded of goofy elementary school students sharing their words of encouragement. You can actually look and and um, be able to, to call this number and hear it, but it was featured on CNN recently. It says it was a, you know incredibly moving collaboration and encouragement that really reminded people the power of the work being done, not only in our schools, but by our children. So definitely go check that out. There is a GoFundMe campaign supporting their work that they just opened up um, just a few weeks ago on March 6th. And they're continuing to celebrate the voices of our students. So kind of a fun opportunity, Todd. What do, what do you think about that? You know, again, again, going circling back to my working with kids is so much more fun than working with adults. When a kid tells you that they like you, you know, it's true. I mean, like they're not, they're going to tell you the truth. I mean, like when you talk with adults, you're like, Oh, I really enjoyed that. And it's like behind they're like, Oh, that was not But like, you can believe the kid. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I would rather get wisdom from kids than adults anyways, because you know that it's genuine and you know that they believe it. So I know when I have a student that says something to me like that, or I had a kid the other day said, um, I was doing invention convention. And I just do that for 45 minutes in the morning. And they're like, I wish I could do this the whole day. And I'm like, there's my week. I have a, a week full of, you know, of, uh, uh, you know, motivation now because that kid said that. So hmm. hearing things like that is always is always wonderful. Well, I think it's a really good opportunity to not only bring this idea to our staff, our friends, our colleagues, but also to our students to elevate other voices. And who knows, maybe some of you listening will create your own hotline experience. There's a lot of ways to do something like that, including just creating a podcast. So depending on what you're looking to do, there's a lot of options out there. Todd, before we go, I do want to make sure that we share again how people can Stay connected to you, not only via Twitter and not only, obviously, by seeing all your books on Amazon, but anywhere that they can continuously learn from you. Yeah. So um, to be honest, I mean, I, I do write books and they sell whatever. I don't get hardly any of that money. So just know that I'm not I'm not like sitting here, like rolling around in my dollar bill, you know, in my my fifty dollar bills or whatever. So I do it to share. And that's that's a method I do that. But another method I do to share it for free is on my website, which is www.thegiftedguy.com. Dot com. And on that, I have links to all the blogs I've written, which I've written over 150 of them, you know, from different uh, platforms. I have, a, a, like you said, when you talked about sharing your voice, you have to figure out different ways to share your voice. I started creating what are called Todd Talks, which are like 15 to, to 40 minute um, tutorials where I work with where I'm just like, here's an idea and, I, and here's how you can do it. And this is what it might look like. And so I have over 100 of those on that site. They're totally free. So um, if you if you've enjoyed hearing me blather on here today or you need you have some difficulty sleeping and you need to, something that was going to put you under, you can watch one of those videos. Um, I also have uh, resources on there uh, for teachers and for kids. Uh, and so, you know, I have that. So uh, that website is my kind of my 
basically what was happening is I was creating all these resources and needed a place, a repository to put them all together. So that's where they all are. So I get people from all over the, it's kind of cool because you can see on the, uh, the, the, I use Squarespace and you can see where people are coming in from. And I get a lot of people from the United States. I'm getting people from all over the world that are coming to that site just to, to get those resources. And, uh, and so that, that, again, that, that warms my heart that I, that these resources are actually being used by people, that it's helpful for people, that they find it um, useful. Because that, that's what it ultimately comes down to is that whether you're speaking at a conference or you're writing a blog or you're writing a book or whatever, you're trying to share a useful idea that someone can use. And if they can't use it, then 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 it's not worth sharing. But if they, they, if it is, then you definitely shouldn't keep it to yourself. You shouldn't be selfish. This is a, a business where we steal from each other, but we also give to one another. And so when you're stealing an idea here, no problem, as long as you're giving an idea over here. Um, and so that's kind of always been my philosophy is that just share it out and, and um, make sure that enough people have access to that. So that's a place where you can uh, find a lot of resources. Outstanding, Todd. Thank you so much for sharing your insight here, but also giving us actionable steps that we can take to continue to be learners. We really, really value that here on the show. And we really appreciate you being able to give us a little taste of all the opportunities out there that we can go take advantage of. Todd, I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your trip with students. I am very uh, jealous, but eager to hear how that goes. Let me know how my application goes being your assistant. I really we'll would do, love we'll to. Do. <laughs> uh, follow you around and, you know, I could carry your, your book bag for you. I could, you know, make sure to help in any way, keep things organized, but you have quite a role and I want to continue to celebrate the work that you're doing. And hopefully fingers crossed, very excited to see you at the teach better conference later the, this fall. So Me thank too. you again so much for, for joining the show. I appreciate you. No problem. And thank you for uh, giving a voice to teachers. Uh, and again, that, that's what it's all about is giving a, a, a a space for teachers to be able to share those things. And this is just one other opportunity. So I appreciate you offering that for teachers as well. Absolutely. So appreciate you for everybody here this morning. It is Tuesday, March 15th, and we are really excited. Oh, so apparently much with the dogs too. We're very excited and everybody included to uh, welcome you into a great Tuesday. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Of course, if you need anything, please feel free to reach out and we will see you tomorrow morning, bright and early. <laughs>